Hi, I'm Jerry Coash Jr., president of Coash and Coash Court Reporting. It's my pleasure to work with the Arizona Paralegal Association to bring you this CLE presentation about remote depositions. I'm going to talk about the basics of remote depositions, handling exhibits remotely and annotating them, and some tools to make your remote depositions go more smoothly both from home or from an office or a conference room setting where you may have multiple people in the same conference room but still socially distance and uh, still using the remote deposition tools effectively. Zoom has become basically the go-to platform for all video meetings since the pandemic from staff meetings to family get-togethers and virtual happy hours and the same goes for remote depositions. So we're going to be talking about Zoom and its tools uh, during this presentation, but what we talk about will apply generally to other remote um, meeting platforms like MS Teams, Google Meets, and GoToMeeting. The first thing we'll talk about is the equipment that you'll need to do remote depositions. Uh, you'll need a laptop with a built-in microphone and camera, which most modern laptops uh, have built in. Uh, if your computer is a desktop computer, those don't have built-in microphones uh, and cameras generally, so you will need an external webcam that connects by USB and speakers. Uh, the webcams generally don't have speakers built in, so those are two separate things that you'll need to connect to your computer uh, if it's a desktop. You can also connect uh, from a tablet like an iPad uh, or through or with your phone. Uh, if you're doing it from home, you're going to want to consider your internet connection more so than if you're doing it from the office. Uh, if it's at all possible, we recommend connecting your computer directly to your router or modem uh, with an Ethernet cable. So getting a 50 or 100 foot cable, however long it needs to be, connecting one end to the back of the router at home and then the other end into the Ethernet cable. Uh, on your computer. It just takes the possibility of Wi-Fi being a problem uh, out of the consideration. If that's not possible, then uh, by all means use Wi-Fi, but you're going to want to get as close as you can to the router uh, so that that Wi-Fi signal doesn't have to travel as far. Uh, even if it's just going you know, a couple of rooms over, uh, just having to go through a couple of walls and then competing with uh, any electronics that may be in between the router and your computer, it can cause uh, disruption in the Wi-Fi signal. So uh, if possible, literally take your computer and do it closer to your, uh, in, in a room closer to where your home router is. You may also want to use a speakerphone uh, in addition to uh, your computer for remote deposition. Uh, why would you want to do that if you uh, are at the office and have uh, a nice high quality conference room speakerphone available? That may give you better audio than using what's built into your computer. Uh, or if people tell you that they can't hear you well through the uh, computer audio that you're using, uh, that may be a signal that you should give um, give a speakerphone a try, or if the internet at your home uh, is just a slow connection or uh, the Wi-Fi is weak because you're far away from the router or there's just uh, interference. So when you're getting ready for your remote deposition, um, plug in your laptop. Uh, it sounds um, simple, and it is, uh, but we have had depositions where we had to take a break because someone's computer uh, ran out of battery power and they had to go scramble to find the power cord. Uh, so just plug it in ahead of time, double check that it's plugged in so you don't get that low battery warning, you know, an hour or two into the deposition. If it's been a while since you've rebooted your computer uh, or your modem and router at home, Go ahead and do that before the deposition. Uh, it kind of clears out the cobwebs and just makes things run faster after a reboot. Uh, so reboot your computer. If, it, if you can, reboot your modem and router. And the way you do that is just unplug the power from both of those uh, devices for 30 seconds and then plug them back in and they will reboot. And I recommend you do this at least 15 minutes, 20 minutes before the deposition. Don't do it right before you're getting ready to connect because these things will all take you know, five to 10 minutes to fully reboot and be ready to use again. Uh, you're gonna wanna turn off any notifications that your computer uh, does. Uh, so that'd be in the Windows settings if it's a PC uh, or in the settings menu uh, of a Mac. Uh, or if you're doing it from a phone, just whatever device it is, turn off the notifications in the settings menu uh, and silence your phone, put it on 
uh, airplane mode or just silent, um, just so if it rings, it doesn't disturb the deposition. Uh, if you use Log Me In or another remote uh, access program to access your work computer from your home, you're going to want to disconnect from that if possible for the remote deposition. Uh, the reason for that is Zoom might get confused about which computer you're actually sitting in front of. So if your home laptop connects to your office computer by Log Me In and, then, and you're connected that way, then you log into Zoom. Zoom may think that it is at your office computer because of the log me in connection. So, and you're, you're not there. You're at home in front of your home computer and your home camera. So uh, if you don't have log me in running, then Zoom won't get confused by that and it'll know where you are. Uh, consider using a headset or a USB uh, speakerphone for the audio. Um, there's lots of options available. Uh, sometimes we use uh, a headset like this. This is a Logitech headset. It's about uh, probably $40 from Amazon. Uh, you know, the kids may have these that they use for video games. You know, maybe you borrow it. Uh, they really do give you uh, good audio because it has a separate uh, microphone attached and it's, and it's right in front of your face. Uh, and it get, and um, you'll hear a lot better uh, if you use that as well. Uh, another great option for audio is uh, a pair of headphones if they have a microphone built into the cord. Uh, so these are the headphones that come with an iPhone. Um, if you're connecting them to a laptop, if it's not a Mac laptop, you will also need uh, an adapter that takes the um, headset uh, connection and converts it into a uh, USB. And then that USB, you'll plug right into uh, your laptop. And from experience, uh, when people attend remote depositions using these headsets, the audio is usually fantastic. Uh, this, the microphone uh, is very close to your mouth where it needs to be, so it picks you up well, uh, and you get that uh, great audio right in your ears. So I uh, highly recommend these uh, if they're available to you. If you have uh, Bluetooth earbuds that uh, you got for your phone, if those can connect to your uh, computer, or uh, your tablet, whatever device you're going to be using to um, attend the deposition, you can uh, definitely use these to do the audio. Uh, it'll most likely be better than the audio from whatever's built into the device, because uh, again, it sits in your ear, it's very close to your mouth, the microphone are very close to your mouth, so it picks up your audio real well. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is the battery life. Uh, these Apple ones, you know, maybe last four or five hours. Other brands, you know, I think last longer. Uh, but uh, if it's a long deposition, you may run into a battery issue. So uh, if it is a situation, if you, if you do want to use these and you can do, you know, one ear, use one ear while the other one stays charged. And then if this battery goes low, switch to the other ear. If you are comfortable using um, them with just one ear at a time. You can do that to make the battery last a little longer, but if it's going to be an all-day deposition and um, uh, you're thinking about using battery-powered uh, wireless Bluetooth uh, earbuds, um, you know, that battery life is going to be is going to be a consideration that you're going to want to think about and maybe use something that's wired, like wired headphones, a wired headset, uh, or the the speakerphone uh, if it's available to you. There are also a lot of great uh, USB speakerphones available. Uh, this is uh, Jabra uh, 510 is a good one for around uh, $150. They have higher end ones up to about $300 for uh, the 710 series. Uh, but these, uh, they have a USB connection so it'll connect to your computer by USB uh, and then it's got a cord and they have uh, they have volume buttons, they have a mute button on the device so you can mute yourself right on the speakerphone rather than uh, muting yourself through the, um, through the uh, audio settings in Zoom. Uh, so these work really well and I'll touch on these again when I talk about how to do a remote deposition from your conference room because uh, these will come in very handy in that, uh, in that setting. We highly recommend that you 
make time to do a test ahead of uh, the remote deposition, uh, especially if you're taking the deposition. Uh, if you haven't done one before or recently, uh, just do a test call. That way we can make sure that the equipment that you're going to use uh, is ready and working properly so we don't have to troubleshoot something the morning of the deposition. And we really recommend this for witnesses as well. Please, uh, if, if the witness is uh, someone that you're in touch with, ask the witness to make time to do a test so that we don't discover on depo day that the witness's computer doesn't have a microphone and uh, then we have to scramble to figure out what to do. Um, and if, if you're not the attorney who's uh, in touch with the witness, ask the witness's counsel or whoever is uh, in touch with the witness to uh, please ask them to make themselves available. The test can be five minutes, 10 minutes tops. Uh, and if, if it goes longer, that's because there's, there's problems that need to address, but uh, it's, it's definitely time well spent uh, and we recommend it. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you block out enough time for the deposition and that the witness does. Uh, if the witness is a doctor, you wanna make sure that they don't have patients waiting uh, in two hours when you were planning on a four hour deposition. Uh, so always make sure that the witness has blocked out enough time for your deposition. Uh, you and everyone is gonna to want to log in at least 20 minutes early to the Zoom link. That way, if there's any technical difficulties that need to get sorted out, we have plenty of time to do that without causing the deposition to start late. If you're doing the deposition from home or from the office, uh, you're gonna to wanna to consider uh, where you're gonna do it. So you're gonna to wanna to choose a quiet location where there aren't a lot of interruptions. Uh, if the kids are at home uh, doing home school, uh, you know, you're gonna to wanna to be in a different room from them because you guys will be able to hear each other. Uh, You'll want to consider the lighting in the room that you're going to be. You'll, you're going to want the light source to be in front of you rather than behind you. So if there's um, only one or two lamps or lights in the room uh, and the big one is behind you, it's going to cause a shadow to be in front of your face so people won't see you that well. So uh, if there's a big window, you want to be kind of facing the window if at all possible, uh, or lamps, have them in front rather than behind you so your face won't be in a shadow and everyone will be able to see you. Uh, you can also use a Zoom virtual background, uh, which you're probably familiar with already, if you don't like the way the room looks that you're going to be doing the depositions. Um, if it's your home, uh, you can fire up a Zoom virtual background. The admonitions that you give witnesses at the beginning of depositions uh, are even more important for Zoom depositions than they are for in-person depositions because everyone is communicating through these uh, electronic devices and people talking over each other causes no one to be able to hear anybody. So you want to make sure that the witness is told to wait for the question to finish before answering the question, even if they know where the attorney is going, you know, don't finish the sentence for them, wait for the attorney to finish their question, and think to yourself, are they really done? And then you can go ahead and give the answer. It keeps the witness from uh, talking over the end of your question, and it also gives other counsel uh, an opportunity to make their objections without objecting over the beginning of the witness's uh, answer. So please don't forget those, um, those admonitions at the beginning of your remote depositions. When Coash and Coash or uh, another court reporting service sets up the Zoom deposition or the Zoom meeting for you, uh, all the parties will receive uh, a Zoom invitation by email. It'll have a link to click on and then it'll have telephone numbers if anyone needs to uh, just dial in by phone and not connect by video. Uh, so once they once the participant clicks on the Zoom link, uh, if, it's, if it's their first time using Zoom on this computer or if it's been a long time, Zoom may ask them to download the software. And um, if it does, uh, usually down at the bottom left of the screen uh, will be a little icon saying that the software has been downloaded. You may need to click uh, the file to, um, to install it, uh, or Zoom may just ask you, you may get a uh, pop-up window asking for permission to open Zoom, uh, so they're going to want to say yes. Most people join by computer audio for the Zoom depositions, and that just uses the audio either built into your laptop or the headset if you're using a headset or the speakerphone if you're using that. Uh, if you need to do 
audio by telephone, then, um, then they can click on the phone call button here and that will bring up a pop-up window that gives the participant phone numbers to dial into and they can dial into any of these and enter the meeting ID, enter their participant ID uh, on the phone touch tone keypad. Uh, if you're already in the meeting and you need to switch to telephone because the audio from your computer is bad, everyone says they can't hear you very well, then uh, in the bottom left corner where the mute button is, is a little, uh, is a little up arrow. If you click on that up arrow, you'll see this leave computer audio button. So when you click that, the same pop-up window will pop up and give you the telephone numbers uh, to dial in. If you'd like to uh, enable a Zoom virtual background, um, first you'll want to find a picture on the internet. So you can Google, Google Zoom backgrounds and you'll get thousands of, of images that you can use for a virtual background. Uh, so find one that you like uh, from Google save it to your hard drive remember where you saved it either into your downloads folder or into your photos folder um, and then in zoom next to the start or stop video icon is this little up arrow click that and then you'll see choose virtual background this window will pop up and if you don't already have a virtual background uh, installed on your computer uh, click this plus key and click add image and that will bring up a window to go browse your computer to find uh, the virtual background that you've downloaded. So browse to your downloads folder or your photos folder wherever you uh, saved that background to. Your deposition notice should say that the deposition is going to be done by Zoom. Uh, so there's no one right way to do that. The most common things that we have seen our clients do uh, is for the place of deposition, instead of putting your office or the witness's office or opposing counsel's office, you can put uh, the, the place of the deposition is remote via Zoom, link to be provided by the court reporter, unless you or your firm is creating your own Zoom meeting links for your depositions. Um, or we've seen place of deposition Zoom video conference from Coash and Coash. The deposition doesn't take place at Coash and Coash, it takes place by Zoom. Uh, another thing that we've seen is, uh, in order to give yourself some flexibility, you can put that the in your notice, put that um, the deposition will be conducted at your office uh, with an asterisk. We reserve the right to conduct the deposition by Zoom if, um, if health concerns uh, cause that to be necessary. That way you can you can start planning and hoping to have an in-person deposition, but then if you know the cases rise and you need to move it to Zoom, your deposition notice is already written for that, so you have options. So you can do it in person, or you can do it by Zoom uh, and have all those options available to you if you put that in your depo notice. The Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure already allow uh, the court reporters to administer the, the oath remotely, uh, so that's not really a consideration. Uh, attorneys have been doing remote depositions and having the court reporter administer oaths remotely by telephone or by video conference for many years uh, for Arizona Superior Court cases. The federal rules allow remote depositions, but they don't say that the court reporter can administer the oath remotely and even though it's not in the rules we've seen over the last six months uh, a lot for federal cases attorneys just stipulating to the fact that the court reporter is not in the same location as the witness but the court reporter is going to administer the oath anyway and counsel can stipulate to that on the record you can put it into your deposition notice uh, and but the by stipulating to it on the record um, counsel agree not to um, raise an issue with the administration of the oath later on. Before your remote deposition, you're going to want to consider how you're going to handle exhibits. Most of our clients email the exhibits to everyone beforehand, either putting them in the email or putting them in a Dropbox folder or share file or whatever file transfer service uh, your firm subscribes to, um, and just sharing the exhibits ahead of time that way. The Zoom screen share is another way 
for you to uh, share exhibits. And you can do that uh, in addition to emailing them to everyone or, or instead of uh, emailing the exhibits out ahead of time. Yeah, using Zoom's screen share gives you a little more control over how the, um, how the deposition goes and it allows you to be more strategic by not, um, not telling everyone what exhibits you're going to use and what order you're going to use them. You can put them up on the Zoom screen share uh, and introduce exhibits when you're ready to. So I will s switch to my Zoom screen and show you how that's done. So here I have my Zoom meeting open. I'm connected, opposing counsel is connected, and the witness is connected. Uh, I've prepared all my potential exhibits in one folder that I've put on my desktop. And we recommend having uh, each exhibit or potential exhibit as a separate file, and we recommend naming them with tab numbers uh, as opposed to pre-naming the files with exhibit numbers. That way, if you change uh, your strategy during the deposition and decide to change up the order that you're going to introduce the documents, you're not committed to those exhibit numbers. So I've named them tabs 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if I want to display uh, tab 1, CDC guidance, uh, as my exhibit number 1, uh, I'll open it first so that it's ready. The court reporter will mark the exhibits uh, after the deposition uh, so you don't have to put an exhibit stamp on them there yourself. Now I'll go back to my Zoom meeting and I'll click the share screen button. So Zoom is going to ask me which file or folder that I have open do I want to share. I can share my entire screen, which right now is taken up by the exhibit, or I can share an individual document. So since I have this file, tab one CDC guidance for reopening open, uh, I can just double click on that file, which is in this um, thumbnail here, and it shares that file with the other parties. Uh, and again, you could uh, just share your entire screen by clicking on share and double clicking on screen and uh, if you do that, then this green outline around the screen uh, will show you uh, what you're sharing with the other parties. So the other parties see exactly what, uh, what I'm seeing on my screen, uh, except for the uh, images uh, of the witnesses. They see this as well, but they don't see my version of it. Uh, so since I'm displaying the uh, exhibit, I control the scrolling. If I want to scroll down to page two, uh, on subsequent pages, I can do that. I can jump from page to page using the Adobe uh, navigation tools. Uh, I can zoom in if it's not uh, clear enough or the print is too small, I zoom out. Uh, but I control what the other people see. And so then when I'm uh, done sharing that exhibit, I click Stop Share and everyone stops seeing uh, what's on my screen so then I can close my exhibit. Uh, I recommend stopping your share by clicking that stop share button uh, when you're done with the exhibit rather than leaving the screen share uh, running while you close the exhibit and then go find uh, the other exhibit. And the reason I do recommend that is that it reduces the chance of you accidentally sharing something that you didn't intend to. Uh, like if your email is open, uh, on your computer. If you stop your share when you're done with the exhibit, then they don't see everything else that's on your computer. If you uh, are still sharing and you just minimize or close your exhibit, and then uh, if, you're, if your email is up on the screen or anything else is up on the screen, uh, the other parties will be able to see that. So if it is something that's confidential uh, or perhaps privileged, uh, that could be seen on the screen. So when you're done with the exhibit, click on stop share and then go into your exhibit folder, you know, decide what exhibit is next. If it's tab two, go ahead and open up exhibit two. So it's already open. And then go back to your Zoom meeting, click on share screen, and either share your screen or share just that one file. And if you share just that file or that uh, program with the other parties, then 
you know, you scroll through it, you ask all your questions about it. If I, since I only right now am sharing this one uh, Adobe Acrobat file, when I close this file, it stops the screen share because it was only sharing that one file. I closed the file, so Zoom ended the share. So by sharing just that one file, I reduce the chance uh, or eliminate the risk uh, of accidentally sharing whatever else is on my computer, whatever other programs I have open. Uh, so I'm done with uh, exhibit two. You know, then I can introduce tab three as exhibit three, tab four as exhibit four when I'm ready. While we're here in Zoom, let me show you how to annotate exhibits during the deposition or allow the witness to annotate an exhibit. So I'm going to open up exhibit three. So I'm gonna open it. I'm gonna go back to my Zoom menu or my Zoom screen, click on share screen. Zoom wants to know what I wanna share. I would like to share tab three, which is also exhibit three. So once you've started a screen share, there is a Zoom toolbar at the top which hides itself when it doesn't think you're using it. So if it has hid it, hidden itself, just move your cursor up to the top of the screen and it'll reappear. So you're gonna to wanna to click the annotate button and that will bring up the annotation tools. So the mouse tool is the one you're going to wanna to use when you are if you need to scroll through the document. When you want to uh, actually annotate it, then you can choose, uh, and most people use the draw tools. There's a thin lined pencil, a thick lined uh, marker, there's an arrow button or an arrow uh, drawing tool, a circle tool. So the pencil tool draws whatever you want to draw. The circle tool will make a circle or an oval around something. The arrow tool will draw an arrow to something that you drag it to. So these are the main uh, annotation tools that you're going to use. Uh, one thing to consider about annotation, however, in Zoom is that Zoom puts these annotations on the screen and not on the document. And what I mean by that is, uh, now that I've made some annotations, if I switch back to the mouse button in order to move through the document, now if I scroll through the document, the annotations stay on my screen in the same spot and not in the same spot on the document, so they're no longer circling what I originally had intended them to circle. If I scroll back up to the top, this is where I originally was. So. These annotations are on the screen and not on the document. So if you want to save the annotations as, a, as an exhibit, you can. You can click Save, and it saves a snapshot of the whole screen uh, into your My Documents folder and into a folder in that My Documents folder called a Zoom, Zoom folder. And then within the Zoom folder, Zoom will create a new folder with today's uh, date and time, and it'll put that... Uh, image file into that folder. So if you want the annotations to be included uh, as an exhibit four, if the clean document was exhibit three, you can click save and it'll save just the screenshot, just this portion of the document here that we have on the screen. Uh, I can clear all my annotations by clicking clear all drawings. And then, so if I wanted to have this exhibit be uh, an annotated exhibit, I would probably zoom out to have the whole diagram uh, shown with the exhibit number. And then if I wanted to uh, circle just the number, I would do that and then click Save. And now I have a picture of the whole screen and it'll include the, um, the Adobe screen. Uh, it'll include uh, this part of the screen because it just takes a snapshot of the whole screen what's showing on your computer at the time. Uh, that'll be saved and I can introduce that as an exhibit if I want. Uh, it saves it as a PNG file which is a type of image file and it's a pretty uh, widely um, 
widely used file type, but if you prefer, you can save it as a PDF uh, file instead. Uh, so that's if you want to save the, the annotations to your hard drive uh, to use as, uh, as an exhibit. Uh, you can also allow the witness to mark up the exhibit. So uh, to do that, I'm going to move my cursor back up to the top to make this toolbar appear again. I'm going to click Remote Control, and this allows me to give remote control to uh, one of the other participants in the meeting. Uh, right now, the Witness is not showing up as an option to give the uh, to give mouse and keyboard control to, uh, but if if this were a real deposition, the witness would be uh, on that list. So you could click that button to give remote control to the witness. I'm going to cancel the control to show it to you again. Uh, it's the toolbar remote control, and then give uh, mouse keyboard control to. Uh, the witness, and then the witness can see their own uh, annotation bar and um, can click on the draw tool and then do whatever annotations that you instruct the witness to. So you'll have to tell the witness, I want you to click on the draw tool and then use your mouse uh, to circle whatever you want the witness to circle. And then again, if you're, if you're having the witness annotate the document, then you probably want to save it as, a, as an exhibit. So click your Save button, and it saves a, a screenshot of the exhibit with the witness's annotations. You're going to want to think about, if you're using Zoom's screen share feature to uh, display exhibits during the deposition, who's going to do that? Uh, a lot of our clients, the attorney does it uh, himself or herself. Uh, if the attorney feels comfortable with the technology, uh, gets a little practice, the attorney um, a lot of the times uh, does that themselves. If the attorney doesn't feel comfortable doing it, a lot of time a, a paralegal or a legal assistant will attend the deposition through Zoom uh, for the purpose of displaying the exhibits. And um, the great thing with that is the the with both the attorney and a paralegal or a legal assistant, uh, they are already familiar with the documents and don't need much instruction. They know which documents are going to be used as uh, exhibits. They know how they're going to be used, so they know when to scroll through the document, to scroll to page two, page three. Uh, they are um, uh, very familiar with how the documents are, are going to be used, uh, so that works out pretty well if either the attorney or uh, a trusted assistant is available. Uh, to do that. Uh, if, if the attorney doesn't feel comfortable and there isn't a paralegal or legal assistant available to help, then a, tech, a video technician uh, from Coash and Coash or your court reporting service can attend the deposition remotely through Zoom for the purpose of, of sharing the exhibits. So uh, if that's something that, that you think you'd like to do, uh, you'd want to let uh, the court reporting service know ahead of time. Uh, so that they can plan for that and have a technician available. So you'll send the exhibits to, uh, to the technician ahead of time by Dropbox or ShareFile or whatever file transfer service your firm uses. And um, a short conversation before the deposition uh, would be advisable. That way the attorney can share with the technician you know, which exhibits they're going to use, what order they're likely to come up in, and just... Um, any guidance that the attorney can give the technician about how the exhibits uh, are going to be used and um, just any tips that they can think of. Uh, and then during the deposition, the attorney will call out the exhibits by tab number or however you've labeled the, the files uh, and say, uh, uh, videographer or exhibit technician, please pull up tab one. I'm introducing this as exhibit one. And then the technician will do that. Now you have to give the technician specific instructions about what to do with the document once it's open. So you'll have to say, scroll to page two, uh, take us to page four, zoom in on that picture. Um, and if you want um, at that point for the technician to annotate the documents or if you want the technician to give the witness control of the document for the witness to then make uh, annotations on the document, you can do that then as well. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of 
of uh, communication uh, with the technician needs to happen so that they, they know what they need to do. Uh, but basically, the court reporter is not uh, the exhibit technician and won't be able to display uh, the exhibits for you during the deposition. And that's something that we've been asked about. So I just have to say the court reporter is focused on writing shorthand, uh, 225 words a minute during the deposition. And so they're not able to do that and um, you know manipulate the exhibits for you. But a video technician can, the attorney uh, or paralegal, the folks that are familiar with the documents. That's where we find uh, most success and our clients have found the most success. Uh, a remote deposition can be videotaped for use at trial. Um, so we don't enable, we don't use the Zoom built-in recording feature for this. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. Zoom, Zoom does have a, a built-in recording feature, but it records everybody. So it records uh, audio and video of the witness, of the attorneys, uh, of anyone else who's attending the deposition. If if your client uh, is attending the deposition to listen in, uh, but has their their um, camera turned on, that person will be video recorded. So it, it records everybody, not just uh, video of the witness, which is the normal protocol for videotape depositions, uh, but it also records um, it records things that are said during breaks uh, and off the record, things that are not intended to be part of the record. So uh, in a normal videotaped in-person deposition, uh, the videographer, when everyone wants to go off the record, stops recording uh, and doesn't record things that are meant to be off the record. If, if the Zoom recording feature is enabled uh, and then used as the deposition video, it will include all of that off the record stuff that nobody uh, wanted to be recorded. So we don't do that. Instead, if a deposition, a remote deposition needs to be recorded for use at trial, we'll have a certified videographer attend the deposition through Zoom remotely, uh, and they can record uh, the screen uh, of just the witness. So they'll, they'll highlight the witness's video. They'll record just the video of the witness, audio of everyone, but video uh, of just the witness, which is the normal uh, videotape deposition protocol. If you're using the Zoom screen share to display exhibits during the deposition, the videographer can also record the screen share if you want. They can record just the witness and have their recording um, not record the screen, the uh, exhibits rather, or they can record both. So when you bring up an exhibit, they can have the like a picture in picture setup. So most of the screen is the exhibit that you put up and then you can have the witnesses video uh, in, in the corner in a smaller screen um, if you prefer. Or it can just be the recording of the witness's video and everyone's audio. So the videographer will follow all the normal procedures that they do for in-person depositions. They'll, read a, they'll do a read-on announcement at the beginning announcing the name of the case, asking counsel to identify themselves for the video record, just like an in-person deposition. When people want to take breaks, the videographer will announce we're going off the record uh, and the time. And uh, they, again, will only record video of the witness, not the video uh, of all the participants on the Zoom. One thing to consider with your uh, remote videotape depositions and, and non-videotape uh, depositions is this, uh, we call it semi-remote, the semi-remote deposition uh, option where, uh, you know, some people are, are in their own offices uh, or homes, but some people are together in a room. So uh, if it makes sense for the videographer to be in the room with the witness because uh, safety protocols allow it, uh, the witness uh, is comfortable with someone being uh, in the room with them, uh, and um, Either the videographer can be in, in the same conference room with them with their camera uh, pointed right at them instead of recording it through the Zoom. Uh, if the court reporter can be in the conference room with the witness, uh, if the you know, social distancing situation in the conference room allows it, if, if the participants are, are okay with a couple people being in the same room together, but not everybody, then that's a total option. It's something that we've uh, been doing since the kind of since the 
second half of the pandemic, I would say. Um, it, it at least, it reduces the number of people in the room, you know, so instead of having five or six people in, in the conference room, you've got two or three. Uh, so you're reducing your risk, you're still keeping some of that in-person uh, deposition uh, feel that, that you're used to, but reducing the risk. You're not, you're not eliminating it, um, but you're reducing it. And sometimes, sometimes it's the best we can do. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about semi-remote depositions uh, because we are seeing a lot more of those lately. And what I mean by that is not everyone is in their own individual location. Everyone is at their home or everyone is at their own office. Some people are remote uh, at their own home or office, but a few people, two people, maybe three people are still together in a conference room. Like maybe your client is being deposed and so you want to be with your client. So you're at, you're in your conference room at your law firm um, and your client is in the same room with you. Uh, there are ways to do that while maintaining social distance, uh, but still have everyone be able to see ev all the other participants on the Zoom screen uh, and see the, wit see the uh, exhibits, if exhibits are being shared, uh, and still be able to hear each other. But there are a few things that you can do to make it more successful. If you just set up two devices, and here I have my laptop and I have an iPad uh, for the witness, I'm the attorney and my client uh, is being deposed and is gonna sit in front of uh, this iPad. So right now we have two devices, both of them connected to Zoom. If both of these devices connect normally, there will be an echo because they will both be transmitting sound, competing sound, and they'll both be um, broadcasting sound through the speakers, and those will cause an echo and uh, probably a high-pitched uh, squealing sound feedback. Uh, so what we need to do is uh, we have to do something different for the sound. We just won't be able to do it that way. So I would say the most uh, effective thing that I have seen uh, in these kind of depositions is uh, both people sit in front of their own device and both parties, the attorney and the witness, have a headset with a, a microphone built into it. So the witness is at the iPad with a headset, attorney is at a laptop or their own iPad with their own headset in. That way the, the sound is only going into both of their ears through the headsets. Each of them has their own microphone to pick up their voice. Uh, the audio is generally beautiful in those situations. So if that's uh, at all possible, uh, I highly recommend it. It just works very well. Uh, another option is um, if, if, the, if the two participants are not very far from each other, and I know that goes uh, against social distancing rules of, of six feet, but if, if the two people are fairly close to each other, one laptop can pick up both parties' audio. It's not great, but I'm gonna talk about it because um, you may need to do it. Uh, so if, if the laptop is close enough to both witness and attorney to pick up both people, then you can mute one device. So turn off the, mute, mute the microphone and also turn the speakers down so that it's not receiving or transmitting any audio from the muted device. And then all the audio will go through just one device. And we'd recommend it be the device closest to the witness because the witness is the person who's it's most important to hear. So if the witness is sitting here, this device, this uh, iPad has its uh, microphone on and its speakers on, this laptop in front of the attorney is set to mute its microphone and turn its audio down. Um, if you try it out and the attorney's objections or cross-examination is still able to be heard by the other parties, then you can do that. Problem is the further, it, it'll hear the witness very well because the witness is sitting right in front of it, but the further the attorney is from that device, the harder time the device has picking up uh, the attorney's voice. So what can you do in that situation if you both don't have a headset? That's an, this is a situation where uh, the USB speakerphone that I talked about, uh, this is the uh, Jabra 
uh, 710, I believe. This can be really useful because you plug it into one of the devices. So I'll plug it into my uh, attorney laptop and then I'll put the speakerphone between us. So it'll go right here closer to the closer to the witness than to me because everyone needs to hear the witness, but still close enough to me that uh, I can also be heard. Uh, and these are designed to be used in conference rooms. So they're designed to pick up volume. Uh, they're not designed to be talked right into like a headset. They're designed to be, you know, a few feet away from the person that they're trying to pick up audio from, but they're way better than what's going to be built into any laptop or any iPad. Uh, it's going to be far superior at picking up two people uh, by this uh, external device because that's what it's, it's built for. And I would like to, to add uh, one side note on these, um, these USB speaker phones. Most of them will have a Bluetooth option. So this one has a Bluetooth button, but if it's got Bluetooth and USB option, you want to plug it in. And that's so that you just don't risk the battery dying, you know, during the deposition. If it's plugged in, it's got uh, an unlimited um, power source, the battery's not going to getting a run down and just eliminating a wireless and a Bluetooth aspect of it just reduces one more opportunity for, uh, for interference or for a problem to develop. So uh, plug it into the USB for power and then just put it in between uh, the attorney and the witness closer to the witness. Uh, and uh, depending how far apart people are, uh, it'll probably do a pretty good job of picking people up, picking up their voices. Uh, since in this scenario you're at your law firm, uh, there's a good chance that you have uh, a nice conference room speakerphone in the room anyway from your uh, telephonic meetings that you've been doing for years. So if this is in the room, these are designed to be put in the middle of a table and pick up two people or a whole bunch of people um, you know, that's what they're made for. So use it if it's in the room. Um, uh, like I described uh, earlier, the Zoom has an option to either do the, do the audio through your computer or uh, tablet device, or there's dial-in phone numbers. So if there's this uh, nice conference room speaker phone available to you at the firm, you can um, in the Zoom audio settings, tell Zoom that you want to switch to phone audio, and then it'll give you that pop-up window that gives you telephone numbers and meeting ID and a, um, a participant code to enter. So it'll give you a phone number, you type in the phone number, the Zoom uh, robot voice will ask you to please enter your meeting ID and then the pound sign. So you do that and then it'll say please enter uh, either your passcode or your user ID and then the pound sign and then you'll do that and then it'll join this phone to the Zoom video conference and it will mute uh, any audio that was being done through your laptop. So then you know you put the speaker phone between, uh, between the two participants. If one of the participants is the witness, put it a little closer to the witness because that's who everyone needs to hear uh, and this will do um, this will do a good job uh, almost, all of, almost always of picking up everybody in the room when you've got more than one person that needs to be uh, in the conference room and then heard on the Zoom. I think one of the best tips uh, that I can give is to communicate. Communicate with your court reporter uh, about what you want to happen for these remote depositions. Um, if you've got a preference, you know, the, the attorney likes to have the court reporter you know, in the room but socially distanced, uh, then, you know, let us know, let your court reporter know that, um, that that's the case and, you know, we can accommodate it. We can, we can work around things. We can come up with solutions when we know that we need to. So um, if you're, whatever concern you have, just, just ask. It's something that we can talk out, come up with a solution. If you, if you aren't sure what you want to do with the exhibits, then say so. Say you'd like some advice then we can, we, can give you, we can go over the options with you, like you know, the same options that I presented in this, um, in this CLE. We can talk about it. We can talk about what makes most sense for you. What's your comfort level with the technology? Do you want to give it a, give it a try? Do you want to have a couple of training sessions where you practice putting exhibits up on the screen uh, and get comfortable with it, get used to it? So there are ways that we can work together to help you take the best depositions that you can. 
When remote depositions became the way to get litigation done, our staff was ready and hit the ground running. But we understand that this is new technology that's been thrown at a lot of you. And so you have questions and concerns. Uh, but chances are that we've dealt with them before and have solutions already. So please reach out and let us know if there's anything that we can do to make your jobs easier. Remote depots aren't going anywhere anytime soon, but we're here to help. So thank you very much to the Arizona Paralegal Association for inviting us to be part of this event. And thank you all for taking the time to watch the CLE presentation. If you have any questions about anything we discussed today, you can call us at 602-258-1440 or email us at scheduling at coashandcoash.com. So we look forward to seeing you all at the next event and be well.